Welcome to the Zealous Podcast. I'm your host, Rocky Snyder, Certified Strength Conditioning Specialist. And this is a show that's all about the pros behind the pros in sports. So we've got athletic trainers, physical therapists, performance directors, strength coaches, nutritionists, and a whole bunch more. This week is no exception. Alana Ash is in the house. Make sure you follow us on Instagram at Rocky underscore Snyder. Click that subscribe button. Tell three friends about Zealous this week. Make sure they subscribe or have them do 20 push-ups. Enjoy the show. Well, today we're going to change topics a little bit. You know, we normally are going in, and of course, Zealous is about the pros behind the pros, and this is no exception, actually. We're we're talking strength conditioning and athletic training and so on, but we're going to take a a different slant. And with me, I have Alana Ash on as my guest. She's in Princeton, New Jersey. She and I met during this past year's New Jersey State Clinic for the National Strength Conditioning Association. And I was just enthralled with her her presentation and she captivated the room and I said, okay, we've we've got to get you on here. So Alana, welcome to the Zealous Podcast. Yeah, thanks Rocky. I'm super happy to be here. Um, So yeah, I'll just, we'll get right into it. So yeah, I, my background is strength and conditioning. Um, I grew up a female athlete and I don't know if I, always knew I was going to be a strength and conditioning coach. I never really knew what I wanted to be. Um, but I always excelled in sports. I was super athletic. I was never the best person on the field, right? I never had the skills, um, but I always was just the hardest working player. Um, like I shared at that state clinic, I was always the first one to beat you in sprints. Um, And that mentality, I think, is something that a lot of athletes have, right? That competitive drive in us. We have that. And today I have healthy ways of channeling it. But when I was a high school athlete on the soccer field, I didn't partly because nobody talked about mental health. I didn't really know what it was. It also came with a ton of anxiety that I also had no idea what it was. And I had no idea that that's something that you could even get help for. Um, So... When I was playing soccer in high school, there was one summer where I put on a little bit of weight and like just a little bit of weight. I've never really been an overweight person. I was always fairly skinny, but I just put on a little bit of weight. And what that did in me was as a high school soccer player, I wanted to learn about nutrition. I took a genuine, innocent interest in the stuff I put into my body. I wanted to be able to feel better, to play better. I didn't understand at the time that there was even a possibility that that could turn into an eating disorder because like I said, nobody talked about it back then. And I thought that eating disorders were for people who cared about being skinny, who wanted to be models. And I also came from like a super loving and supportive family. So there's just no way that could ever happen to me. So I'm going to do this and like not even think twice about it. Um, so I found that I had no idea what I was doing. I started dieting, like not really, in a smart way, not paying anybody to help me who's an expert, kind of just reading different headlines in the, I mean, we didn't really have social media back then. I'm not that old, but it wasn't a thing, but we had magazines and stuff that like said, don't eat fat, don't eat carbs, like all those things. And just as a high schooler trying to take in all those messages, it was overwhelming and it was scary, but my anxiety kind of latched onto that and was able to feel like a little bit like, oh, this is control. Let's do this. Right. And I just became very, very restrictive in what I ate. And then I continued to work really, really hard at the same time. Um, And the mix of that just made me lose weight very quickly. And like I said, I wasn't that, I I never had weight to lose really. Um, So it turned into a full-blown eating disorder. And I didn't even know it. I talked about in the state clinic how my soccer coach is the first one to suspect that I had an eating disorder. And well, were you, you know, starving yourself? Were you binging? What was the kind of behavior we're talking about? It was mostly restriction. It was I was um, diagnosed with anorexia shortly after that, but it was mostly restriction. Um, like I said, like I. I was scared of carbs, right? But like extremely scared that if I ate carbs, they would make me fat. But there's so much more to it than that, right? Like 
I think that we could look on the surface of an eating disorder and see somebody who's scared of carbs. And I think so many females have that fear today, um, eating disorder or not. I know a lot of people that don't realize how many carbs athletes really need. Um, so I was very restrictive in the amount of carbs I ate, but then also with that comes that competitiveness that I was talking about earlier. That's like, okay, I would play these games with myself almost like, okay, if I eat this many carbs this day, I have to eat less the next day. Right. And it just kind of gets to the point where like, I'm really not eating any carbs at all. And um, then did you have to increase your running volume? Because you've mentioned, you know, you wanted to uh, sprint and, be, and beat you to the finish line. You're doing soccer. I can only imagine that running was a, a huge component in terms of exercise or activity for you. Yeah. Running was huge. Um, because back then too, strength and conditioning was still like, oh, strength and conditioning for high school athletes even like isn't good, right? So the only thing I really knew how to do was to run. So I ran a lot and there's actually, I forget the exact like science or reasoning behind this, but when somebody is struggling or developing anorexia, there's a period where their performance increases actually. Um, when they start restricting, I forget the process that causes that, but a little bit of it meant is mental. It's almost like a high you get like, oh, I'm restricting, I'm doing this. And I don't know if this is going to make sense, but the eating disorder, I, I would imagine it like this monster claw wrapped around my brain. And like the more I would listen to that claw, the more that it would make me feel good, but mm -hmm. more at the same time. I'm sick and suffering and, and yeah. So like when you first start that claw, when you listen to it, it makes you feel so good. So you almost get a high from it and that, and then there is something with the feeling too. I forget, like, I forget exactly what's going on, but you're able to perform better for like a little bit before your performance does eventually decline because you are just, um, so malnourished. But That's that dangerous. It's totally so dangerous, right? Because then if you're noticing a slight spike in performance due to this behavior, it's going to reinforce it all the more. Yeah, exactly. And that's, that's exactly what happened. But then also too, to touch on your point, my soccer coach, I was a four year varsity player in high school. Um, my senior year, I didn't play in high school because my coach, like I said, she knew, she suspected very heavily that I had an eating disorder. She knew it before I did. And I talked about at the clinic how she, her way of showing me that she cared was by not playing me at the time, right? And she should not have played me. Um, but when she wouldn't play me, I would go home and run because I felt like I didn't exercise enough that day, right? And I needed to run. Um, so, so yeah, you had touched on that. So I did just want to mention that and bring that up as well. Yeah. And so... How did I just, if you don't mind, like, how did that progress? How did that get to a point? Because I can only imagine there's usually, there's, there's two elements that create change as I keep coming to. It's inspiration and desperation, right? It was, was there a moment of, well, we may call it uh, incomprehensible demoralization, right? I, you know, is there, was there a, a bottom that you hit? Was, did it occur in high school? Was there some type of gathering between your coach and your families? What, what happened? Yeah. So I didn't, I didn't get to talk about this at the clinic. Um, what happened was with the eating disorder, right. And we could get into how that manifested later into addiction and alcoholism, but I was going away. So I was a senior playing soccer fall season in the winter. I had started to see a therapist at that point, um, mostly for anxiety. And I think she also suspected that I had an eating disorder, but I, for all the reasons I mentioned earlier, for like, I came from a loving and supportive family. I was an athlete that doesn't happen to people like me. I had no idea that I had one. Right. Um, but I was seeing her mostly for the anxiety at the time, because that was just getting like unbearable. I felt like I was crawling out of my skin. I just felt trapped. Um, and my, me and my cousin were going to go visit my brother who was in school in Colorado on a snowboarding trip. But my therapist and my doctors were like, 
but you could go, but you can't snowboard because you're just too frail and weak. And if you fall and break a bone, like that's just super dangerous for you right now. So I remember going, like preparing for that trip. And in my head, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna go relax on this vacation. I'm gonna eat whatever I wanna eat. It's gonna be awesome. And like, I'm doing this on my own in my head, like not even telling anybody, but that was my plan. So I go on that trip and I couldn't eat anything that I wanted. Like my, that monster just stopped me. Like I remember I was almost building up in my head, like, okay, I'm gonna have like a big greasy sandwich or something, right? At some point. And I just couldn't make myself do it. And that was so confused. Oops, sorry. Um, that was so confusing for me because I just didn't understand why I couldn't do it. So after that, I went home and talked to my therapist about that experience because I was just so confused. I'm like, why can't I eat the sandwich? I love sandwiches. Um, and I guess through talking to her, I was like, oh, maybe there's something mental going on in my brain. Like maybe I do have an eating disorder and I need help. Wow. Yeah. And this is probably a good time to note that you are a certified strength conditioning specialist and, and have other certifications under your belt, but many of those don't take into consideration um, to, to some degree, uh, fueling, nutrition, eating disorders, and so on. It's primarily movement-based, which is through no fault of any association. It's just the way that that is, but it it does show a certain disconnect between eating behaviors and performance. You almost have to seek it out at different, in, in different vehicles, different organizations, if, if we're going to delve into it. You know what I'm trying to get to? This is, this is something that we don't speak of very much in the world of strength conditioning. Whether it's, whether it's female or male sports, doesn't matter because it occurs in both. And, and I think it's it's really cool that we can talk about this. Yeah, I, I love that we're talking about it. I, I really do. Um, and then, I mean, a whole nother direction is kind of just the, what I talked about at the clinic. Like, right, yeah, we talk about it, but preventively, preventive, pre wow, <laughs> um, preventatively, what are we doing about it, right? Um, and I want to kind of put a pin in that because um, my story didn't end there, right? Um, as you no, or maybe not, because this is the whole chunk that like I left out of my story because I got so nervous at the presentation. Um, but I talked about, so after that, where I went to the therapist and I talked to her and she helped me admit and get to the realization that I do need help. I went to an outpatient program for my eating disorder, but it was a mix between me not being completely ready to let go and understanding my anxiety and all of that and just also some of the messages that I received at that program, um, I didn't really get better at that program. It was helpful and I put on some much needed weights and I was able to go to college the next year, but I really didn't deal with like the underlying anxiety and all that stuff. So when I went away to college the next year, um, that's when my addiction developed and I got very much into drugs and alcohol and at that point it was kind of just like I stopped playing soccer at that point um I was gonna like try club but I remember one day like you had to get up at 6 a.m to go play club soccer and I was just such in the grips of addiction at that point that I could not possibly have done that um so but what I kind of see now is what happened was I talk about that monster with my eating disorder and then because I didn't deal with any of the anxiety that I had, it was almost like I was using this drug and alcohol monster to escape that monster. Because when I used drugs and alcohol, I didn't think about food, right? And for me at the time, like that was amazing. But then also part of my anxiety was a lot of social anxiety and just like being so consumed with that self-centered fear about what people think of me. So drugs and alcohol gave me the confidence in college to go out and like make friends. Um, so that was, I guess you could almost call it like a positive cause I was going out and being social, but at the same time I was using it way too much and kind of dying on the inside and no one could see just how 
anxious and emotionally and physically and spiritually sick that I was. Yeah, and in the college environment, that's just rife. You know, there's there's that moving away from home, a sense of individual freedom, and and the governing wires kind of come off the engine, and we can easily uh, find our way into that. I mean, I speak from experience myself. Although I went to a, a notable university at the time, it was just considered also a party school, and and we just went along for the ride until those things don't work anymore, right? We use them as tools to, yeah. to cope or to address issues that we were having. And at one point in time, they were working in a positive manner. But uh, whether we use that monster claw analogy, every drink we took or every, every substance that we ingested some way or other, that, that claw just started to have a, a stronger grip and started to basically start coming down into us and impaling us with a lot of pain, a lot more fear, a lot more anxiety. All the things that we're trying to drive out of our existence was actually being created more and more. I don't know. Did you feel that yourself? Yeah, definitely. Right. Yeah. It's um, it works for a little bit. Right. There's that saying we have in the rooms where at first alcohol is fun. And then it's fun with problems and then it's it's just problems and that was definitely my experience with it so and yet at the same time you continued to wrap your athletic pursuits i I'm did I somehow in the midst of all of that when i was in college um ran two marathons part of it was because of that competitiveness in me and my cousin had run a marathon i'm like oh well he's not I'm like, oh, if he could do it, then I could do it, right? And then the other piece of it was, I'm going to run the second marathon because people are starting, people who love me and who care about me are starting to tell me that I have a problem with drugs and alcohol. So I'm going to run this marathon to show you that I don't because addicts don't run marathons, right? Like that was my crazy brain and rationalization at the time. Well, that's really cool. There's something we have in common. In 1999, the Sacramento Marathon was going to be the first weekend of December. So uh, my birthday falls near the end of September. And I figured, okay, that's going to be a time to just clean my act up. And I'm going to stop all these things we've been talking about. And we'll stop it on my belly button birthday. And I'm going to start training for the Sacramento Marathon. Because that is, you need a goal, don't you? You need something, right? So and, you know, to some degree it worked, but fortunately, somewhere along the way in my training regimen, I came into contact with other people that were actually staying away from drugs, alcohol, substances, and so on. And for me, growing up in the Irish uh, Roman Catholic suburbs of Boston, which is otherwise known as CIA, Catholic Irish Alcoholics, uh, you, you know, growing up in the CIA, it just became, that's just what everybody did back there. In fact, you go to any Facebook post of my high school friends, and rarely do you ever not see something in someone's hand, whether it's on the golf course or at a restaurant, they're all, I mean, that is just culturally what you do in the Northeast, at least where I grew up. So to actually envision, to actually meet people that weren't doing those with, with smiles and, and, and happiness in their life. I'm like, whoa, that's strange. Well, how are you doing that? Tell me more. And so then we became friends. And next thing you know, we're going to gatherings and so on and, and finding ways to, to live after that, which has been a phenomenal journey. So um, kind of crazy. How did it go after the marathons? I'm sorry? How did it go after your marathons? Did it work? Um... No, did it? <laughs> it's not what no. you do. <laughs> well, it no, it, the marathon did not work. It just coincided with That's meeting true. meeting friends that we've stayed we've stayed friends for you know almost twenty five years now, and we're we continue the journey that we're on, uh, one of just you know complete abstinence from these things, and and life has a way of getting amazing, but. But it doesn't sound like the, you know, the marathon wasn't going to work. Like, hands down, it wasn't. It was just a, it was a farce. It was just something that, you know, once I crossed the finish line, some, if somebody was going to hand me a beer, I'd probably take it. But fortunately, 
other things occurred before that moment. So uh, I've just been on the same path since then. But what happened with you? Um, they, they do have beer at the end of some marathons, though. Yes, yes. And water stations or beer stations. It's, it's really quite crazy. We'll talk. Let's, we're going to put a pin in that one, too. When it comes to conferences and socials in, in strength conditioning and fitness conferences, yeah, we got to talk about that. But what happened after the marathon? Um, so after the marathon, the marathon had to be in like 2010, maybe. And I didn't get sober until 2014. So it clearly didn't work. <laughs> um, <laughs> so what happened was for those next four years, um, it just got a lot worse. And for me, the training for the marathon kind of kept things in control for a little bit. Like I made a lot of rules for myself. And because I was training, I could stick to those rules. Like, okay, we could only um, do stuff on the weekends, right? Or like, just yeah, little rules like that, even though you end up breaking those rules anyway, right? Uh, but as soon as I stopped training, like the wheels kind of came off. And nothing really like happened, to be honest. It was almost a gradual thing where eventually like it got to a point where I was just so sick and tired of being sick and tired. And also what, what did kind of happen was I saw, I like barely had any friends at the time that I still talked to, but I still had friends that I followed on social media and whatnot. And one of the great things about social media that I try and do with my social media is give hope, right? To share the message that it does get better. And I saw my friends like starting to, advance their careers and get involved in serious relationships and get married and just like really create their futures we we're like all 24 25 26 years old and I know now right not to compare especially on social media but at the time seeing that and my life was going absolutely nowhere um it really made me look at my life and just be like Alana what are you doing um and then on top of that, I moved back in with my parents in May. So like I saw that move back in with my parents and was just like, wow, I really have nothing going on. And then I met my birthdays in May. And I like so seriously, my parents live at the Jersey Shore. And I oh, remember, nice. yeah, on my birthday, I was like, went for a run on the boardwalk and I'm like, all right, we're going to turn our lives around. This is going to be great. And for May, June, July, and August that summer, I could not stay sober. Like it was just me on my own, still not really being able to do it on my own. Still, my life was really not going anywhere. Um, so finally in August, what happened was somebody that I knew again on social media, I just knew through the grapevine because we had a lot of mutual friends that she was sober. And I had watched her post pictures for like the past year of her being happy and like living a sober life and I was just like how are you possibly doing that right kind of like what you were saying before like oh that's possible um and she one of the reasons I reached out to her was because there's two reasons um one was because I was doing I was into pain pills and like roxaset and those oxycontins and she was doing those same drugs so like I knew she got it also, this is part of what I forgot at the conference too. Um, at that conference, I talked about how big camp was to me and she was my camp counselor. She was the one who actually, I know people who are listening to this won't know this, but you will. I had talked about, if you remember that counselor who wrote my name on her arm for that 10th grade soccer tournament, it was her, right? So that counselor, she meant the world to me and I mean, I just saw her being sober. So I reached out to her and I'm like, Hey, like, what are you possibly doing? I need help. And I remember she, um, I think I emailed her and she had emailed me back and she said, can you talk like at this time? And it was Tuesday, the middle of the day, she called me on her lunch break. And she basically, what I know now was 12 step me, right? She shared her experience, her strength and hope with me and told me what she did. And I remember it's Tuesday at noon and I'm drinking a beer and she's telling me to go to meetings and I'm just like, I'm, I'm not an alcoholic. Um, what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. I really didn't think they were for me. But at the time, I was just so broken. Like, just all parts of me were broken, physically, spiritually, emotionally. So I gave it a shot. 
Um, and what I saw when I went to those meetings was that, like you said, people were sober and happy. And like those two things, sober and happy, were just things that I didn't think that I could ever be at the same time again. So going to those meetings and like getting that hope was so helpful. And those meetings are what works for me. And one of the things that I like about meetings that I didn't really get at that outpatient program that I also talked about was just like, when I went to the meetings, as broken as I was, they told me that I could still help people and that I had something to offer. And that was not the message I received when I went to that outpatient program at first for my eating disorder. And I think that that's a message, just the fact that we, no matter where we are, the fact that we could help people is such an important message. And I think especially in today, like that's something I try and teach my athletes. Like you might think you're not the best player on your team and that you have nothing to offer to that team, but you do because you're just a human being and you have value. And so just teaching these kids like to realize their value and share it with the world, right? Because of all things that have helped me in my recovery, like that's the number one thing that I always still go back to. Yeah. That is fabulous. And so, uh, okay, I guess it's time to pull those pins and bring them back in. Uh, your pin, do you remember what it was? We're going to put a pin in that. My pin, I believe, was about working in the health industry and being so unhealthy. Um, but then I also want to hear more about what helped you, like your bottom and how you turned your life around. Ah, okay. All right. We'll go there. So a bottom to me is defined as being unable to lower your standards faster than the consequences build up. Okay. How about that one? Yeah. I, you can only lower your, yeah. yeah I can't I lower my, st my standards can't be lowered faster than the consequences build up. Um, it wasn't, you know, I, for me, I, I didn't lose anything. I had my studio that was only a couple of years old. I had a couple of business partners. They were sharing the load, but you know, I would have an attitude adjustment in the middle of the day and then come back and, and work with clients, you know, work with clients in the morning, take a break in the middle of the day and do what I would call an attitude adjustment, take something, drink something, whatever, coping mechanism, I'm all by myself out here on the West Coast, all families back in the East Coast, trying to make my, something of myself and, uh, and putting on a good show on the outside. But on the inside, you know, it just, there, there's a hole that I kept trying to fill. And no matter how much I tried pouring into it, it just got bigger and bigger to the point where then I found myself just alone in my little beach house in the middle of the day, not wanting to go and do anything. And then it was just back to work. It was just this vicious kind of, Groundhog Day, every day, same thing, day after day. And then it just got to the point where um, somebody that I care about very deeply saw what was happening with me and approached me and said, you know, I don't know if I can continue this way with you in my life. Uh, you can keep doing what you're doing, but I need to make a decision whether or not I want to stick around. And uh, and that was enough of a bottom for me to realize that uh, my actions were negatively affecting those around me and those that I care the most about, where I was completely oblivious to that uh, all this time trying to help people improve their life, get healthier and so on. And being the, the caregiver and not being a caretaker, right? Giving care outwardly to all those around me without putting the seatbelt on me or the air mask on me first in that kind of plane crash analogy, right? So uh, I had to do a, a turnaround. I had to change some priorities, but I couldn't do it myself. I had tried that before and it just got worse until there came a moment in time where I came into contact with these people that were doing what it is that I wanted to be doing. And, and stopping was not not the issue so much as what do you do after you stop? Because that was virgin territory for me. I had no idea. I can stop, but, uh, but if I don't have the tools to use or the understanding of what to do, then I'm probably going to just pick up again, which has proven before. So now I've got these tools and this, this, this group, this um, camaraderie, and, and guys are actually telling 
the truth and sharing what it was like and, and their emotions, which was very new to me. And I'm like, whoa, I had this brotherhood now. And, and they had your back. And then I learned how to have theirs. And, you know, I did it on one day and then I tried to repeat it the very next day and, and then tried to make a pattern of that. And so far it's, it's been something that has continued on to this day. And, and, you know, they, you say that it's like a, a country song played backwards. You start getting, you know, your dog comes back and your girlfriend comes back and you get all these things that keep coming back into your life. Uh, and, and that's really what it is. It built up a really successful business over the course of, uh, I can't believe I'm saying this, four decades. And, um, you know, speaking with yourself and, and being on a speaking circuit, so to, so to say, uh, is, has just been a remarkable journey. Writing several books, having this podcast, having a loving family, raising two amazing kids, having a loving wife. I mean, these are all just gifts that have come by changing, by recognizing that there is a disease within me that has no solution, no cure, just a daily reprieve from it if I do the right things. And so that's, that's really it. And I don't really share this very often, especially in a podcast setting, because, you know, there's a side that, not that I, I don't necessarily want to keep this private. In fact, I'll, I'll share this with anybody. Obviously, we're doing it right now. But there hasn't come a moment, there hasn't been an opportunity that I have chosen until I heard you speak. And then it just said, okay, I think now is the time. I think it is, it is a great opportunity to share our experience of what's going on and what it's like now and how it is actually in the strength and conditioning community. It's in the health and fitness crowd. I mean, we're all trying to strive for peak performance, but that can come at a cost as we have both found out. So yeah, it's, it's really great. I mean, I was just so, on, honestly, I was just almost giddy. I was smiling a, as you were presenting to this crowd and, and they were quite engaged, which was nice. And you, you gave some great exercises for them to collaborate with their neighbors sitting beside them and, and asking questions and really listening and a whole bunch of things that were really quite nice. And I thought, oh yeah, this is great. Because growing up, I'll say, in the NSCA, I recall several conferences where after the day was over, everybody would head to the bar, wherever mm -hmm. we were. This year, it's gonna be Las Vegas. I can only imagine how many attendees are going to go out and go nuts because they're in Vegas. But then there's also social hour, like there's gonna be an evening where there's gonna be an open bar for health and fitness and strength and conditioning professionals. Now, I'm not saying we should, you know, there, there, I'm sure there's plenty of people out there that can utilize those things in a proper manner and have a good time with them. I'm just not one of those. And I'm wondering how many others in attendance are like that. And, and it, where just there's kind of a disconnect. Like you say, with, with fueling the athletic body, how does, how does uh, some of these substances affect the body for performance, right? There's, there's, a, there's a hypocrisy, I guess I'll say. So I've bantered on long enough though. I wanna, I wanna hear more about you. Um, well, I mean, you just said a lot of awesome things. One thing that I did wanna follow up and ask you about just because I think it it's gonna be helpful and kind of has to do with what I, I talked about at the NSCA. Like you mentioned, I gave tools, right? And we talked about breathing, journaling, just how impactful listening is. And that's something that is so, I don't think people realize how much we don't listen to each other because we're so distracted by notifications coming up on our phones and stuff like that. But you mentioned that today you have tools, right? You could stop drinking, but when you stop drinking, you have tools today that you use to help you. And I, because we're in the same program, probably know what some of them are, but I was wondering if you could share one or two that you might think would be helpful for people listening who might um, just be curious or need it. 
Well, welcome back to the Alana Ash podcast. Uh, it's just, that's hilarious. No, I'm just kidding. You know, I, I think they're they're kind of universal tools. We just we just phrase them in certain ways or um, or house them in a certain kind of structure. But honestly, spiritual principles: yeah. honesty, honesty, brotherly love, humility. Um, th- those are are really some of the fundamental firmament that we're yeah. talking about. Can you be teachable? Can you put your ego aside and, and practice a little humility and know that you don't know everything and be willing to be able to be teachable? And, and that's, that's, that's big for me. Uh, truly care about the people that you're working with and not just the goal, but really how are they doing? Like trying to infuse some of these principles into my daily life, including my work life, has been just huge for me. And I think that, I will say I know that that is part of the recipe for success in being a trainer and a conditioning specialist and getting people to come in and change. I work with a lot of people that are dealing with chronic pain. And that pain manifests in so many different ways, physical, but also psychosocial emotional, spiritual, and not that I get too out there on the fringe and, and try to address those different elements, but if you affect one thing, you affect everything. So if we start to bring the body into a place of, of happiness, stability, of less pain, it gives permission and, and encouragement for those other elements to, to kind of come along. So yeah, with, with certain aspects of what I've learned over the years, it would be impossible for me not to filter into my, to my own work life. Uh, and that's with my staff and with the clients and, and athletes and, and colleagues for that matter. So trying to work with others that are in that have are going through the same. So on the outside of my workplace, there's individuals in the community that may need some help along the same line. So I make myself open to that opportunity because I learn so much from those that are struggling with these these issues, these symptoms of a disease. And and in some selfish sense, it it provides me with what I need. So by helping others, you help yourself, right? Those are the things. Being, uh, being okay with not being the best or smartest is okay too. You know, actually trying to find, I want to be the dumbest person in a room because that gives me so much more opportunity to learn. I don't want to be the expert that everyone's coming to for advice. I mean, that's fine temporarily, but really put me in a place where I am uncomfortable because that's where change occurs. I mean, so, so not to get too deep into this, but I think that many of us just live inside the comfort circle yeah. and physically as well as mentally. You know, there's, it, it requires effort to lengthen a body if it's restricted. And, and most of us just wanna shorten those muscles more and more by lifting. How many, how many individuals do you know that really love lifting that really don't do well with flexibility training or opening the body back up because that requires effort. Just like somebody that is very flexible, that goes to yoga all the time, really has a hard time going into a strength training program. It's just, it, it takes us outside of our comfort zone. But if we do that, oh boy, that's when the nervous system lights up. That's when a whole bunch of things light up. Our spirit comes alive. And so can we challenge our ourselves to get outside that comfort zone yeah that's that's kind of where I go yeah what about you so for me I mean I love that you said spirituality right because that's such a big thing that I don't think we talk about enough today um just in the realm of our profession but just in general in the whole mental health space um I love that I think people are like scared to talk about it and some people might not really know what it is, but for me, that's, that's been huge to kind of learn that we're all connected and here to help each other. And also that 
there's something, there's just something out there, right? That connects us that we don't really understand. Um, and I didn't know anything about that. And I was so close-minded to that until I got into the rooms. It helped me open myself up to that and like unpacking that or going to that, I feel like is a whole other rabbit hole to go down. Um, but one thing that I did want to mention that I love that you mentioned too, is just the basics, like the flexibility and mobility, right? That's something that so many lifters don't do today. So many athletes don't do that today. Like it's so hard to get my middle schoolers to stretch. Um, and it goes such a long way for them. It's the basics, right? And one of my things is don't wait to break before you start to build. So I think building up habits like of just stretching, just taking care of your whole body, like not just lifting, that's so important. But I also understand too, how complicated and overwhelming our industry can make those things. It's like, oh, well, I already go work out. Now I have to go learn about like mobility and how to stretch and what that is. And like, I get that. And part of what I want to do is to help bring that back to basics and not make it so overwhelming. And one of the things I really liked about your topic at the state clinic and that I'm still doing today is just those little stretches that you gave us, like the hip rotations that we do, like I still do that today. Um, so that one was super helpful because that's such basic body movements and basic exercises that our industry has gone so far away from. And I don't know if it's because of social media and it's not the coolest looking thing, right? Like, so no one wants to do it, but they are so important. Just like building up those basic tools. Like, I mean, I talked about at the clinic, like how impactful journaling is to me, right? That's just such a basic tool that I use today. Um, I actually, I'll share this little story. I had a powerlifting competition a week or so ago and it didn't go well. Um, and I almost, I wanted to quit like a day or so before it, because it was just, it was not a good experience. Um, so I had this text written out to my coach and I was going to tell him that I'm dropping out. And before I hit that send button, I picked up my notebook and I just wrote. And by the time I finished journaling, I came to the conclusion that like, okay, training hasn't been going well. Let's just go to the meet, get the experience because you've only been to one before. This is number two do your best and like try and be helpful see who you can help because you, you've been to one so you have experience at one um and just see what you can give and that's what i did and it ended up being a great time i deleted that text to my coach and i'm happy that i went right so just like it's such a basic thing but it's so impactful and breathing too i think is another super basic thing that we've gotten so far away from that helps performance in so many ways um so I guess those are my tools beyond spirituality, right? Um, but I think that, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there and see if you want to jump in. Yeah, no, I, I love that. I love it. it it's, it's an interesting journey that the mind takes from understanding the basics to more complex understandings and concepts. But ultimately, it comes right back around to the basics. In our industry, it would be the pillars of movement, push, pull, level change, rotation, locomotion. And we can go on an endless journey into all the actions and, and technical information of that, but ultimately it comes back around to that. I've got a, a anecdotally a little story. So my son, when he was very young, I think about five years old, he began karate in karate classes. And he had a goal to work up to being a black belt. And he actually attained that goal at, at a fairly, you know, about, it took him about seven years or so. So at the age of 12 or 13, he became a, what they call a junior black belt. But his sensei is this older, portly, white haired man with this really thick handlebar mustache and very, you know, you could just sense wisdom just in how he stood. And he would wear his karate gi. And he had, he was a many degree black belts, like top uh, in the nation, training all these peace officers and so on. But he was the gentlest soul. And as he awarded 
my son his black belt there, I noticed his black belt that he had had for, for I don't know how many decades had been so well worn that the black had worn away. And all it was was this kind of dingy white belt, which is what they give a beginner. And right there in that moment, I'm going, oh my gosh, that is how, how awesome is that? This man has been on a journey of 50 or 60 years of studying from some of the greatest minds in martial arts. And he has achieved the highest level in his discipline of study to the point where he is now once again a white belt, right? It comes full circle back around where granted he was really wearing a black belt, but it looked white at the time. I'm going, oh, it just comes back to punch, block, kick. It's all the same. So for us and our, our path of, of staying where we are and, and recovering from where we've been, it's like there's some basic things that we just do. Be humble, help others, be of service to those around you. How we do that could be very complex, but it really comes back to the basics. So one thing cool. I, I did think about too, when you were talking about humility earlier and just like being the dumbest person in the room, I agree with that, but I do just want to almost talk to, cause I know there's other female, like youth athletes, especially out there who struggle with confidence because that was me a hundred percent. Like I had no confidence, no self-esteem. And that was a big part of my anxiety. But just like, I would go into a room and just automatically think that I'm the dumbest one there in a negative way. And just like lack that confidence or that I could have anything to give to that room or to a team. So there, there is a level there of like, not thinking you're the smartest one in the room, but also not thinking you are the dumbest one in the room, but you're somewhere in between, right? Like, I think that that's a good place to be. And I could still struggle with that today for sure um because that it's almost like that imposter syndrome right like i could definitely go back to that default and be so full of self-doubt and the tools that we've been talking about today are things that i've used to help build up to that confidence but not take it to the point where like just ego takes it out of control and i think that some people could definitely go from having no confidence to having like a huge ego and it goes out of proportion but then they go through their journey and learn how to reel it in a little bit, or maybe they don't, right? Everybody's different. Um, but I did just want to make that point because I know there are people out there who struggle with stuff like imposter syndrome and just lack of confidence and self-esteem too. So there's definitely two edges to that sword. Yeah. And along that same line, I mean, the, the demographics of our listening audience for Zealous, uh, a high percentage are the, the young professionals, the, the trainers, and conditioning specialists, physical therapists that are say mid twenties to mid thirties. So quite possibly if we run the numbers and do like probability, there's probably a, a few people listening right now to this podcast that may fall into the same category that we found ourselves in earlier in our life and are wondering, how do I get out of this? Or what do I do? Or maybe I don't have a problem, but everybody else thinks I do. Is there someone I could talk to or somewhere I can turn? So my question to you is, would you be open to anybody kind of reaching out and contacting you? Yeah, please. Um, I would love that. My, I mean, my Instagram is the better coach and my email too. I'm happy to give that. It's just Alana, A-L-A-N-A -A -A dot Ash, A-S-C-H at gmail.com. Um, those are like the two best places to get in touch with me for sure. Fantastic. And the same holds true for me too. So if there's any male professionals out there looking to just have a conversation, completely open to it. Now, I, I have to admit, I was so surprised to know that that was your very first presentation at the New Jersey State Clinic because you crushed it. You did a great job. And of course, in your head, you're going, I missed, I forgot this, I forgot that. Uh, nobody knew that you yeah. forgot any of those things. And you did a fabulous, fabulous job. And, and you crushed it in that red dress too. No other presenter could have pulled off that outfit the way you did. Thank you. I have to shout out. Um, do you know who Rachel Balkovec is? I, I'm sad to say no, but I'm about to. Yeah, I have to shout her out um, because she, she's the presenter who I did mention 
in my presentation. She works with the New York Yankees. She may have just switched jobs, but she is doing awesome things for female coaches out here. Um, she's one of the first major league baseball. I don't know if she made it to manager yet, um, but she's awesome. She's doing like amazing things. Um, that is her goal. I know that. So back in like 20, I think it was 2019, um, she gave a speech at one of these clinics and she got up there and she looked so presentable. And I remember thinking how much better she looks than all the other presenters there who are all males, right? And like, it was just so cool seeing a woman up there crushing it. And um, she had looked good and she definitely made an impression on me, right? I think I talk about too how after that evening or that day, I went home and journaled and realized that the only reason she could do that and I couldn't was because she believed in herself, right? And that I was still so full of self-doubt at the time. So I started to do all the things that you and I have been talking about today. But also I knew that I wanted to go into this presentation and make that impression on somebody else, right? So like I made sure to, to look good that day. So I'm very happy that you acknowledge that and realize that. Thank you. Right on. Yeah, well, it was quite obvious. And I think several others would easily uh, echo my sentiments for sure. You know, Alana, this has been a great conversation. And for the listening audience, obviously, we took a different tack today, but hopefully it's one that's, uh, that resonates with a few, if not several of you. And uh, I, I love it. I love your journey. I love what you've been doing. I love what you're accomplishing, not just what you have accomplished. And of course, I know there's going to be more and I can't wait for the next time our paths cross either virtually or in person, because I know it's just going to be the same as what we just shared in this hour. So thank you for coming on. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Rocky. I appreciate it. And I really do hope that our paths cross again, uh, for sure, in the future. And that's it for this episode of Zealous. And uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I know it was a little bit different, but there's nothing wrong with being a little bit honest, sharing the truth, our mistakes, our lessons we learn from it, and a whole bunch more. Until next week, make it a good one.